Okay, now that you've got a little bit more exposure to what layering is and how Android uses layering, we're gonna spend some time digging more deeply into some of the lower layer parts of the Android Linux kernel. And this will actually be a multi-part uh, lecture or multi-part lesson, starting out initially with discussions about storage mechanisms, including both primary and secondary storage. Now, some of you may have be familiar with this in the context of operating systems course. I'll try to focus the discussion on mobile devices, which will give you a little different flavor of storage in that context, which is somewhat different from storage in, say, a, uh, a desktop or laptop environment, for reasons as we'll see in a second. So in Android, as in pretty much any system, the software instructions and data can reside in two different types of storage. One type of storage is what we typically call primary storage or random access memory, which is fast and it's very, very efficient. But the downside is the second that your phone gets turned off uh, or when you run out of power or whatnot, then any of the contents that are in RAM disappear because it's so-called volatile memory. The second model of storage is what's typically called secondary storage, which back in the old days was handled with disk spinning disk, nobody puts spinning disk in a, in a smartphone, although you might still have spinning disk on some laptops, although increasingly we're moving towards um, sort of uh, storage that's electronic, uh, SSD storage, solid state drive storage. But on a smartphone, it's typically stored in so-called flash memory, which is still electronic, but it's slower. And the nice thing about flash is it's persistent, meaning that if you shut the system down and and restart it, anything that's stored in flash memory should be, um, still have the same values unless something goes horribly wrong. Primary and secondary storage are part of something called a memory hierarchy. I don't know how much you guys have been exposed to this. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. It's, it's really quite interesting. Um, and in particular, the, the parts that are the primary storage, which is RAM, and the parts that's the sort of secondary storage, which, which is the flash, are sort of in the middle of the memory hierarchy. Uh, if you take a look here, as we'll see in a second, you'll see that the uh, memory hierarchy is designed with a couple of things in mind. In general, the closer you are to the top or the apex in the hierarchy, the faster the memory will be. So you'll be able to get to the contents of the memory more rapidly. So the rate at which you can store data or read and write the data will go up. And, and things here would be stuff like um, you know, processor cache or processor registers. So obviously it's going to be really fast to get to this stuff, but you can only have a limited amount of it. Now, of course, nowadays that's megabytes, but it's still limited by uh, in terms of the vast amount of storage that's available in other parts of the system, other parts of the hierarchy. So for example, if you want to have like, you know, tape backup, uh, obviously nobody puts tape drives on smartphones either, but, um, or really on almost anything these days except uh, sort of disaster recovery or um, storage that you need to be able to preserve for compliance reasons or so on. So, you know, stuff at the bottom, very, very cheap, huge capacity, but slow to access stuff sort of, the next layer up would be things like hard drives, which are, um, slower, very, very cheap. You can store lots of data. So it's basically organized like this. Um, another thing that is implied by where you are in the hierarchy is the time that the CPU takes to access the data will be lower, the latency will be lower the higher up you are. So the point between when the CPU says, get me something at this address, and when you get something back at that address, the closer you are to the top, the faster it'll be. And there's other dimensions here as well that are important. So the cost is greater. So in general, the higher up, the more expensive. Um, even that's relative. Obviously, things keep getting cheaper and cheaper over time. Processor cores that are running on the system and accessing this memory operate on instructions in their data that, that reside in RAM. So the processor, or the processor cores more specifically, are accessing the memory that's in random access memory. If something resides in secondary storage, it needs to be transferred into RAM before the processor can really do anything useful to it. So, and that's also worth 
keeping in mind when we talk about this stuff. The Android Linux, uh, Android Linux executes in something called kernel space RAM. So this is special memory that's protected. And what that means is that uh, there's certain types of operations that can only be performed in the kernel when you're running in kernel mode. This is for safety and robustness and security reasons. And if anybody tries to access this region of memory and they're not authorized, they're not given proper permissions because they're not running in kernel mode, then they won't be able to access this memory. So this memory is essentially kind of fenced off. Even though it exists there on the processor, or it's, it's, it exists in the memory hierarchy and the processor can get to it, it's fenced off by the memory management unit hardware to protect it. Um, you might have remembered there was some exploits that happened on some of the Intel processors about a year or so ago, or it became widely known about a year or so ago, where there were flaws in the way that the caching system worked, and so you could actually exploit the memory that was supposedly protected when it was moved into the cache. That shouldn't happen. That, that's, a, that's a flaw. <laughs> it shouldn't be doing things like that. So kernel space is protected, and you can only access the contents of kernel space as a user by making system calls. And that's those APIs I was telling you about before. So if you think about the Linux kernel, there's the libc library. The libc library, which is, of course, written in C, makes calls to so-called system calls. And those are used to transfer from the user space into the kernel space. And then the implementations of those system calls can do privileged things, like reading and writing data from uh, I.O. devices that user applications are not permitted to do directly. So that's, that's kind of how they enforce the security parts. Android apps, in contrast to the Android Linux kernel, execute in user space RAM. So, you know, your browser, your email, your phone, all of these apps execute in user space, and they make system calls, or somebody makes system calls, not usually the apps, but the, the things that the apps call, which access the hardware abstraction layer and the virtual machine and all that kind of stuff. They are the things that are making the calls that end up ultimately going into the kernel. User space is more restrictive than kernel space, and that's by design. You don't want to allow people to do things that will cause corruption. And uh, as a general rule of thumb, if you have multiple apps running in user space in separate processes, they can't access each other's memory unless you explicitly use features like shared memory, which is doable in Android, but it requires some additional work. We'll talk more about that later. So the, again, these things are kind of fenced off from each other, so they can't mess with uh, the state and the data if they're not in intentionally allowed. Over the last couple of decades, the cost and performance of primary and secondary storage has improved substantially. This is another kind of one of those Moore's Law type of things where if you wait long enough, everything gets cheaper and faster uh, forever. At least your computer technology does. And everything else seems to get more expensive, like property and, and stuff. But the computers get cheaper. Uh, and, and the computer components get cheaper. As we talked about before, unlike your laptop or unlike a server, for sure, the amount of RAM that you have on a mobile device is going to be more constrained. Now, this is all relative, right? So on my, on my laptop, I'll typically have you know, 32 or 64 gigabytes of RAM. So it's enormous amount of space. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a grad student, we were really excited because some of the Sun workstations we had had four megabytes of memory. And that was like so cool because it was just an amazing amount, way, way more than the 640K that you had with DOS at the time. With smartphones, you'll see that it's, it's not quite that good, although it's gotten a lot better recently. So here's kind of a, an example of the form factors and the amount of memory available in each of them. So as of about last year, two to four gigabytes is pretty common for mobile devices, you know, like, like a smartphone or a tablet, versus eight to 64 gigabytes on a desktop or laptop. So, you know, it's, it's a basically almost an order of magnitude difference, I guess. There's also price point issues here. So people typically don't want to go out and spend, you know, some, some will go out and spend 
you know, $4,000 on a high-end laptop, you're very unlikely to go out and spend $4,000 on a high-end phone, right? <laughs> it just wouldn't have a market. There is one here. What the heck is this? This is like some special, I don't know, like um, I'm trying to see what that emblem, I think it's like a Cadillac phone. Or there's some phone that's branded to be a high-end phone, but uh, most people don't go out and buy phones for, to be prestigious at that price point. Most people want to go out and buy cheap phones that are either you know, built into their cell plan or a couple hundred bucks at most. Maybe I think the price point for high-end smartphones is like seven to $800, but it's not $4,000. So that also is a driver that keeps down the costs or keeps down the amount of a memory that's available because people don't want to pay that much. Android has a virtual memory manager that enhances or, or varies from what you find in Linux out of the box to deal with these address constraints, so the memory constraints. So they have virtual memory. If you recall from the OS course, virtual memory basically gives you the illusion of a very large linear address space that is then uh, sharing a smaller amount of physical memory. So let's say, uh, again, if, if you have four gigabytes of memory, this is a little bit silly. But if back in the old days, if you had 200 megabytes of memory available, uh, you could have an application that would take way more than that. And so the Android memory manager would have to be responsible for giving you the, you the illusion of a larger amount of memory. And that's what the virtual memory management portions do. Um, so the way that Android works is, unlike Linux, unlike GNU Linux, it doesn't actually move, uh, well, uh, sorry. All the different systems will move memory from secondary to primary storage when they're accessed. So this is what's often called demand paging or on-demand access. The other thing that you get with both Linux and Android Linux is the ability to memory map your I.O. devices into memory so you can treat them as though they were a linear array of bytes. Uh, you, it's, you don't really get that with, you don't get that at the Java programming layer, but you get that at the implementation of the system layer. So you can memory map various devices into memory and then access them as though they were in memory. Um, that's called memory mapping. And of course, the other thing that the virtual memory manager does is it protects the different applications from stomping in each other's memory. There's a number of different ways that Android stores data persistently. So you can do things like shared preferences, where this is, this is more at the application, or at the uh, Android library layer. The core libraries in Android give you this shared preference thing, which allows you to store simple data like strings and integers and longs and so on in key value pairs that will live between runs of your app. There's also, of course, what's called external storage. And that's basically storage that goes out on a, on a typically in flash memory on your device. And Android has changed quite a bit over the years to try to make the security of external storage tighter, so it's harder to exploit things. There's also internal storage, which is private data that's stored in the device memory that you can store. And then there's also something that's the most common way of storing things in Android, which is called SQL Lite. And this is basically an implementation of SQL, the structured query language, that can work in the confines of a mobile device. Android, Android Linux also supports access to secondary storage by something called the Virtual File System, or VFS. And as you can see here, VFS basically gives you a set of implementation artifacts to access uh, memory that's cached and also memory that will be stored in the flash memory. So this, this gets into sort of low-level details. There's a, a kernel module that resides in the Android Linux kernel that provides the VFS implementation. There's a couple different variants. Most of this stuff is completely hidden from you as an application developer. And the way it's implemented is using the flash memory files. And so this is basically electronic memory that can be erased and reprogrammed. So it's think of it like a really fast, writable uh, CD-ROM. OK, so that's kind of the end of, of that discussion. We'll uh, continue this discussion on